Good, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Philip Munoz. I'm the director of the Center for Citizenship and Constitutional Government, and it's my pleasure to introduce you, uh, to welcome you to today's lecture. Uh, the center, as I think most of you know, we, um, our, our job at the center is to train citizens, uh, citizens who can protect their God-given natural rights, assume the responsibilities of self-government, and pursue the common good. And there's no better way we can do that by introducing the next generations uh, of leaders um, to this generation's distinguished leaders. Uh, so the work we're doing today, um, we secretary spent all afternoon with students, the work we're doing today is right at the heart of what the center does. Uh, leadership, um, leadership is no more, is never more important than at times of war. And right now we need we need leaders, and we need to train leaders for the future. Uh, today's lecture is particularly meaningful, especially uh, to me. Um, the Secretary is delivering our 2023 Jeannie Poole O'Shaughnessy Lecture. Uh, Mrs. O'Shaughnessy was a member of the class of 1986. Uh, I think she was a cheerleader when she was here. Uh, she loved Notre Dame, and um, she loved her country. Two years ago, she passed away unexpectedly uh, and quite tragically. Um, and uh, we do this lecture um, in part to remember um, her contribution to Notre Dame and her contribution uh, to uh, our community uh, and, and indeed the country. Uh, Jeannie's husband, Patrick, is here with us and, and her family and her Notre Dame friends. So Patrick, thank you. Um, we are, we are a world-class research university here at Notre Dame, but we're also a family. Um, we had a mass with the O'Shaughnessy's this afternoon. Um, so Patrick, please know that this is always your home. Jeannie will always be remembered here, um, and we welcome you to come back always, and especially for this lecture. So thank you for being here. Um, there's a lot of individuals in the audience who have, make, who have helped make everything we do possible. I, I certainly can't thank you, thank you all, but thank you for being here uh, with us. Um, I want to thank Mike Dash, my colleague, uh, the director of the Notre Dame International Security Center for co-sponsoring today's event. Um, special thanks to uh, Ray Connell, who's helped us put this event together, and his family, so thank you very much, Ray. Um, I, I really need to thank my staff. Um, they're just tremendous, and they've been working extraordinarily hard. Um, the security concerns alone with this event are, are um, significant. So thank you to my staff. They, we only made one mistake. It's true. Um, I didn't actually have a ticket when I came. <laughs> so there's an there's a usher named David in the back who does a very good job, because I had a hard time getting in. <laughs> It's a true story. <laughs> okay, for questions, we want to get as many questions uh, as we can, and we actually want the audience to um, ask questions, not give talks. So this is what we're, we're doing. So you should have got one of these. It has a QR code. Um, scan this, and you can type in your question. I will get them on a laptop, and I will, you'll be able to see everyone's questions. You can actually vote on which questions you want me to ask, and I'll, I'll relay your questions to the secretary. Um, at the end of, uh, after his um, presentation, and we'll get as many questions as we can asked. So we have a tradition at the center. We have uh, one of our undergraduate fellows uh, introduce our speakers. As I said, the secretary met with our undergraduates um, all afternoon. Um, I'm gonna deviate from that tradition uh, today for, uh, I think, an appropriate reason. Um, introducing uh, the secretary today is a graduate student, a PhD student of mine. He's in political philosophy and constitutional studies, uh, Hadar Hazoni. Um, Hadar is from Jerusalem, and uh, after the Sabbath, he's going to go. He's going to fly to Israel uh, to be with his family and to fight for his country. Hadar, uh, know that our prayers are with you, um, with all those who are suffering and especially with Israel. Hadar.
This afternoon's Jeannie Poole O'Shaughnessy Memorial Lecture will be delivered by the 70, 70th Secretary of State, Michael Pompeo. Secretary Pompeo attended the Military Academy at West Point, graduating first in his class in 1986. Following his graduation, he served as a cavalry officer, patrolling the Iron Curtain prior to the fall of the Berlin Wall, and later in the 7th Cavalry in the U.S. Army's 4th Infantry Division. After completing his service in the U.S. Army, Secretary Pompeo returned to the U.S. and went back to school, earning his law degree from Harvard University, where he served as the editor of the Harvard Law Review. He later worked for Williams and Connolly in Washington, D.C. Secretary Pompeo went on to found Thayer Aerospace in 1998 and then served as president of Century International, an oil field equipment manufacturing distribution and service company. In 2010, he returned to public service and was elected to Kansas's fourth congressional district, where he served for four terms. During that time, he served on the House Intelligence Committee, as well as the Energy and Co Commerce Committee, and the House Select Benghazi Committee. In January of 2017, Secretary Pompeo was confirmed as director of the Central Intelligence Agency. The following year, on April 26, 2018, he was sworn in as the 70th Secretary of State under President Donald Trump. Under his leadership, the Department of State established the Commission on In Unalienable Rights, which sought to offer advice on human rights grounded in our nation's founding principles and the principles of the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Recently, he joined Ambassador David Friedman in hosting Route 60, The Biblical Highway, a documentary that takes viewers down the historic highway in Israel that served as the setting for countless Old and New Testament events. His lecture today is titled, Religious Liberty, Courage, and the Necessity of Leadership. I wanted to take this opportunity uh, at a time when the United States stands so nobly and loyally in friendship with the Jewish people in the state of Israel to say that Secretary Pompeo is a shining example of that friendship. As part of the Donald Trump administration and with others, he worked to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's one and eternal capital and to move the American embassy to Jerusalem, which meant the world to me and my people. Others know my people as the people of the book, Am Sefer, but the Jews know themselves as Am HaNetzach, the eternal people. And the eternal people remember eternally, and we will remember Secretary Pompeo as a friend of the Jewish people eternally. Please join me in giving a very warm Notre Dame welcome to the 70th Secretary of State, Secretary Michael Pompeo. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all for that uh, warm welcome. When I get that much applause before I speak, it always makes me very nervous. <laughs> um, it makes me especially nervous on a day where I'm following someone who is uh, prepared to go back and do uh, what people of conscience and duty do to protect your family and your nation. Bless you, Hodder, for what you're about to do. Um, it, is, it, is, it, is, I, it is noble, it is exceptional, but I have found with the Jewish people it is typical of their commitment to their nation. And, you are, and God is watching over you. I'm convinced of that. I hope he's watching over me today, too, at this special place. Um, as I give these remarks in the context of a world that is involved in two wars, one in Europe and now one in the Middle East. Uh, and the topic prepared to today, uh, uh, I, I, it would be remiss if I didn't address a little bit about that happened now seven days ago. Um, but I know we'll have a chance to take questions. And so I, I, I do want to stay true to why it is you all asked me to be here. I will talk about human dignity and private property. I will talk about faith and its role as we try to lead our nation here forward. And I'll get the chance to do it at this place that is so unique and so special that values God and country and uh, understands the importance of duty to this nation that has given us all so much. We are obliged we're obliged to consider ideas that touch on things that matter 
and I'm honored to be with you. I'll do so today by reflecting on the things that I did when I had the privilege to serve. Liberty, courage, religious faith, the necessity for leadership in our nation. These are all things that are interrelated. They touch on issues that matter. You know, we all watched the barbarity take place on October 7th. Israel, the Jewish people, many Americans today are fighting for their very survival as we sit here today. Great numbers have already been murdered by Hamas. Israelis and Americans are being held in detention. When, uh, when the United States fails to lead, then the bad actors in the world, people like the leaders of the Islamic of Republic of Iran, take note. It is absolutely essential that we stand by our friend and partner in Israel. I am heartened by the, works, the words of President Biden as he has demonstrated American resolve to continue to do so. I must say that it is important that we begin to recognize that evil roams this planet, and we don't forget that. I was asked today by one of the students, like, what's the end of this? And the truth is, for those of us who know the Bible, we know that there is no earthly end. Right? This all ends when he comes home <laughs> to take us back. And so what Israel will do over the coming days and weeks will be difficult. It will at times appear ugly, and it is necessary. It is absolutely necessary. The Israeli government has a responsibility to protect its people, to protect its sovereignty. And I pray that the United States, as it gets more difficult in the days ahead, will not lose faith and will not lose the capacity to do what the American people know is right. We know that the Jewish people are not the aggressors. We know that we hear that language used by our fellow Americans, and we know that it is reprehensible when they do so. I watched the fall of Kabul. I watched Vladimir Putin invade Europe. And I watched America applaud itself for saying that these were successful efforts on behalf of our country. But more important than the fact that I watched it, I know that the leadership in Iran watched it as well and saw that opportunity might be meeting capability in a way that led to the slaughter of innocents in the Negev. We can do better. We must do better. And in the coming days, we will be commanded and the world will demand that we do better. We, um, we must not allow terrorists to ever have the perception in their own minds and hearts that they have succeeded. This is the mission that we now face. Weakness, indecisiveness, indecisiveness disengagement on the world stage. These things invite conflict. Let's learn this lesson. Timidity is prov provocative. Evil emboldens tyrants. And when we do this right, we will act with our allies to affect strategic clarity unmistakable to any terrorist, whether that's Vladimir Putin or the Ayatollah or even Xi Jinping, who is watching this all close, so closely in China. You know, I, uh, I spoke about Europe. I gave some remarks in June of this year, or June of 2022, at the Hudson Institute. Uh, in that speech, I talked about Israel as the keystone of the global alliance. I saw it when I was a Secretary of State. I saw them as a great partner. My, my Republican idol, President Reagan, knew this too. After the assassination attempt that almost claimed his life, he gave a commencement address here on these grounds at Notre Dame. This was 1981. It's the first time he'd spoken publicly since he they had tried to kill him. He, uh, he uh, talked about the film that he'd starred in when he played George Gipp in Newt Rockney. <laughs> You'll remember Korea had suffered a brutal occupation. Libya faced mass incarceration and murder. The Jews of Europe had endured the early stages of a genocide. And President Reagan was talking about how goodness could prevail against such evil tide. His remarks, President Reagan's remarks that day were pretty insightful. In recalling the character of Newt Rockne, President Reagan said that the coach believed that the noblest work of man was the molding of character. Rockne and Gipp, 
who only thought of others in his last moments, represent the standards of devotion, selfless faith, and love to which we must all aspire. And I'm confident that we all can. You know, President Reagan's reminiscences are more than just nostalgia. It's coincidental that I get to stand on this same hallowed ground, but they, because they represent the quintessence of what it is to be human. They represent what it means to join together in hope and prayer to attain what would otherwise be unachievable. It's how we prevailed in the Second World War. We, the decent people of the world. The same forces were marshaled by a giant whom Ronald Reagan knew and loved. Working toward a common purpose, President Reagan and Pope John Paul II achieved what seemed impossible, the defeat of the evil empire. The world shall forever remain indebted to St. John Paul, for he championed freedom as he bestowed the blessings of our Lord upon peoples that had been deprived of faith and hope. In his encyclical of 1981, Through Work, Pope John Paul II discussed this very idea. He talked about religious liberty and fellowship and respect. Intended to mark the anniversary of Pope Leo XIII's encyclical, Pope John Paul II's work was delayed by several months due to an assassination attempt on his life. As published, the saint's composition is a milestone in humanity's progress, its march towards liberty and freedom. In it, he wrote, quote, the church's teaching has always expressed the strong and deep conviction that man's work concerns not only the economy, but also and especially personal values. The economic system and the production process benefit precisely when these personal values are fully respected. In the mind of St. Thomas Aquinas, this is the principal reason in favor of private ownership of the means of production, end of quote. We see too many places in the world where private property is just a fantasy. The Chinese Communist Party believes that they own all of the world. These ideas violate the most fundamental sense of the natural order, which teaches individual is prior to society, and society must be ordered to the good of the individual. We watch what's taking place in the world today. You can all see it. Autocrats understand their temporal power can never truly crush faith, but they work to crush it despite that. I hope we'll all take that lesson of history to heart. As a soldier who faced the massive forces of the Warsaw Pact before it fell, I was much younger. I could actually fit in a tank then. <laughs> I, I knew that I didn't stand alone. I comprehended, as did my brothers and sisters, my fellow lieutenants and soldiers, the nature of the threat and its evilness, and I understood the essential nature of faith as the basis for human freedom. It gave me and my team encouragement every day. You should know that uh, I was in Kyiv earlier this year and that the lamp of faith continues to grow in the hearts of the Ukrainians who fight President Putin's current onslaught. It exists today in Africa and the Middle East and those who battle terrorism, and it lights the way for patriots who oppose Xi Jinping in Asia. We, um, we were pretty serious in the Trump administration about advocating for religious freedom everywhere. It wasn't just an afterthought. It wasn't something we did because we thought we'd win brownie points at the State Department. You should laugh there. <laughs> we did it because it was noble and because it was righteous and because it would improve the lives of people all over the world, even if we weren't able to achieve it everywhere and always. John Witherspoon, a, a Scottish Calvinist, was James Madison's tutor in Hebrew and in philosophy when Madison studied these subjects. The principal author of our Constitution and the Bill of Rights would hold the only Roman Catholic signer of the Declaration of Independence, a fellow named Chris Carroll, as a dear and close friend. Remarkably, though Carroll was one of the wealthiest Americans of his time, his faith had barred him before the founding of our country from holding public office. Quite remarkable. He was a patriot. Madison, Washington, did not allow their theological differences to stand between what they knew needed to be done for their country. You know, this brings us to patriotism. You know, the, word, the origin of the word patriot, its etymology derives from both the conception of religious liberty and the birth of our country. Today, the term patriot is often mocked, right? 
They say they're shilling American patriots. Uh, it's indecent. The word comes from the French, which stems from the Greek. There's a long history of patriotism. It really means fellow countrymen. That's how it was in its original. After the ravages of the religious wars that bled Europe, patriot was applied to those who'd placed country above their sectarian desires. It's thus related to the word compatriot. And before our revolution here in America, men such as Benjamin Franklin would write of true patriots who sought liberty from an oppressive empire. Predictably, the British used the word as a slur. Franklin's description connotes love. It connotes decency of country and tolerance for the belief of our fellow citizens. In his letter to the Toro congregation, President Washington wrote, quote, the citizens of the United States of America have a right to applaud themselves for having given to mankind examples of an enlarged and liberal policy, a policy worthy of imitation. Ladies and gentlemen, we must continue as a nation to, to do that, to be worthy of imitation. To be sure, the liberty that Washington wrote about wasn't enjoyed by all. Slavery and prejudice were still rampant. But American patriotism, in our deepest understanding of that term, constituted a decisive step forward for freedom, a progression towards universal freedom, unique amongst civilizational history for all humanity, even though today we are not fully there. Today, Christianity is besieged in the West and in the East, in Africa, in the Middle East, and in villages whose sorrows we do not yet know, but we can imagine. What is the light that will protect Christianity from those powers set loose by communist or authoritarian regimes? It is his word. What is the force that will quell those who seek a different age for humankind, a technological age in which many tragically renounce God's love, love in the pursuit of unquenched materialism? I would posit to you today the answer is righteousness. I use that word a lot. Washington Post didn't like it. I use the word righteousness because I think and to this day believe that it is exemplified by the lifetime of service of leadership and laity of the Roman Catholic Church. Christianity today derives great power from its many forms. For each attempts to vivify Christ's word through his undertaking, marked difficulty. It requires the perception of the present in accordance with the laws of the infinite. Now, I stand here at a Catholic institution as an evangelical Christian and an unemployed former diplomat. <laughs> but having come to know Jesus Christ through the Bible, led by a couple of fellow cadets at the United States Military Academy, uh, I, I watched as they cared enough for me to show me not only the way to a better life, but the way to eternal peace and the fellowship of God. In their treasured company, I learned that while money is used to establish value, it can never be used to establish worth. Worth resides in the individual and is created by God. This is the truth that drives the terrorists crazy. We all, every one of us, needs to comprehend that unchecked materialism is not the essence of our nation. America was founded on a Judeo-Christian set of principles that seek to obtain balance between the rewards of our life here on earth and our spiritual needs and obligations. It's this balance that our Lord Jesus Christ portrayed in his ministry. I, um, I, I watch. I watch as the world sometimes forgets that the leadership of China wants to destroy the things that this institution stands for. It would be impossible for the conception of life that is put forward here to be trampled upon by an idea that is so wrong, for the denial of primacy of the individual that you all know matters. The Chinese Communist Party, in its essence, is a repudiation of the value of one's labor as a manifestation of each person's unique gifts, and it is a rejection of God and his dominion over all creation. The misappropriation of faith and religion for temporal power to give sustenance to a dying regime is the hallmark of tyrants. Those who would hail the People's Republic of China as the model of a modern nation misconstrue what the communist state intends, that which is universal, universal servitude and collectivism. 
Those who are beguiled by this fail to grasp the unintended consequence of their own actions. China today is what America could become tomorrow if we allow unchecked materialism, exploitation, and the misuse of technology to trample the precepts that we hold dear. I will never be dissuaded from the core fact that we live in a moral universe created by God and not by man. The day our country no longer expresses this truth will be the day America ceases to be America. America, for humanity, unbounded by God's laws, will be cast adrift in a sea of absolute destitute carnage. I'm counting on none of you to ever let that happen. As Secretary of State, I kept an open Bible on my desk, and I read from it, I, this, the speech says every day, I'll be truthful, I read from it almost every day. <laughs> but I was pretty diligent. I was diligent because it mattered to me, it grounded me, it brought me back to what it was, was my mission. And no matter what the media was doing, whatever the noise, I could return to these words that humbled me, encouraged me, and guided me. I sought, sought to attain the tools of leadership, and my belief in a better world empowered me each day to do my best, in spite of all of my shortcomings, to serve each and every one of you. And despite our many challenges, I believe, I believe it's the break of dawn for our country. I truly see it. I had a chance to be with some of your students today. My goodness, inspirational. We must meet these challenges with purpose, with virtue, and with determination. And I'm confident that we will, fortified by the knowledge that our nation is a force for good. It's not that we don't get it wrong, but the present darkness must presage a new day. Our country will persevere through what remains of the, what are the remnants of the night. We're poised for a resurgence. I can feel it every place I go. So long as we do what is righteous and heed the call to rebuild our foundations, the foundations of our nation, so that our children and their posterity may rejoice in a land that must always be a beacon unto the world. You should know that the world is counting on us for that. I... Uh, I had the chance to travel to 100 plus countries as the CI director and your Secretary of State. Every place that I went, that leader of that country wanted to see me. I wasn't his counterpart. I was not the president nor a prime minister. I was a mere cabinet official. But they wanted to see me, not because of Mike, but because I represented the United States of America. And whether they were a true friend or a partner or sometimes a troublemaker, they wanted to see me because they knew that we had the power to unleash good for their own people through our leadership, through our faith, for our, through our continued determination. We had tough conversations. We did not always agree. It's unimaginable that any nation would agree with what we were doing. Goodness gracious, only half of Americans did on any given day. But these leaders around the world understood that America would be around that America would be important, and that if they were alongside of America, if they could find a way to grasp all that was good in our country, then they would have a better run as the leader of theirs. We, we know the history of solidarity. We know the history of faith underwriting our Judeo-Christian traditions. Here today, sitting in front of you, getting the chance to say my piece and to articulate a vision for a path for American greatness forward is an enormous privilege to be on this campus where free speech is welcomed and to appear in front of people who won't always agree is something that I know I am privileged to do. Uh, I said, you know, that I only read the Bible most days. Uh, every day I take a look at the blue passport that I have the privilege to carry. Hundreds of millions of people all across the world have, and in some cases have died, seeking to obtain that same privilege. We should honor it. You should know that each day, even if I don't get to my Bible, I do say prayers, along with my wife. I pray for my son. I now pray for my daughter-in-law. My son got married about a year ago. So far, so good. Uh, I, 
I, I take seriously that obligation, and I'm counting on each of you to do that as well, because it is through his grace that America has prospered for the first 250 years, and that I am confident it will continue to prosper for the next 250 years. Thank you for the chance to be with you. I look forward to a rambunctious question and answer period. <laughs> and, uh, and I am truly privileged to be in this great institution today. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. You uh, remember your cards, and I get your questions right here. Um, if you, you can put your name, it'd be nice if you put your name, and if you're a student, make sure you note that you're a student. We always like uh, to have our students ask the first question. So I'm gonna, um, I'm a man of the people, so and you can vote for the, for the questions. So I, um, if you vote for them, um, I'll take that uh, into consideration, and then I'll decide what to ask. Um, <laughs> That's right. The it's first question always is... Always a perfect democracy. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> republic. It's a republic. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, the first question is from Chris. This is the most popular one. Uh, the the Russian-Ukraine war and Hamas attacks are showing the rise of drone-dominated, a, a drone-dominated military paradigm. Uh -huh. How do you believe the U.S. should adapt to these lessons? Oh, goodness. Um, it is, there is no doubt that... Uh, Every military force in the world is observing what's happening in, in Europe today in the con conflict between um, Russian aggression and the Ukrainian sovereignty. Uh, not just with drones is war different. Uh, technology is different. The information space is a radically important place. Uh, there, are, there is a propaganda war that is full on being played out not just in Europe and in Russia, but all across the world, indeed on your very cell phones today. Uh, the Russians, the Chinese have massive efforts to convince you of things that simply aren't true or are at least biased in the direction that they would prefer. So yes, warfare often evolves in significant ways and we can see that playing out. Uh, what does that mean? It, it means several things. One, all of those responsible for American national security, we immediately turn to think of our Department of Defense, but this would apply to the State Department, Homeland Security, the FBI, all of our intelligence services, indeed those of our partner nations across the world, we have to become faster and more nimble. Uh, we have to be able to evolve at the speed of conflict. And Ukrainians are doing amazing work at that. If you look at some of the tactics and procedures that they have adopted, they are truly things that are going to teach the United States military an awful lot. Uh, and the last thing I'll say, so, so yes, uh, warfare is fundamentally different than when I was a young soldier in the uh, mid-1980s. Uh, the last thing I'll say about this is, we should never underestimate, too, the importance of American leadership, even in this space. Our capacity and scale are unrivaled in the world. When I was the CIA director, I spent a whole lot of time in Ukraine. We had the CIA training Ukrainian special operators. And you would think, goodness gracious, what's the CIA doing that for, right? Why are we spending American taxpayers' dollars? As it turns out, I am enormously proud that it was some of those same special operators that at an airport not too far north of Kiev to turn back what would have been the Russian foothold. And so you should be incredibly proud of the work that the United States did in that space to develop a set of tactics and procedures that could push back against an army that was mu of much greater size and scale. And we need to make sure that our military is prepared to fight a war that matches the great power conflict that is now approaching from the Chinese Communist Party. Okay. Uh, this question, uh, the, the Question of the people who want, uh, given that there are 1.1 million people um, told to evacuate Gaza and they're trapped uh, by blockade, including partly by Israel, why should the United States, or should the United States support uh, what seems to be an upcoming invasion by Israel? Um, the, the fact that civilians are being used to shield terrorists is something that is horrific. It is as barbaric as the actions that took place on October 7th. Uh, I am confident. I, I worked alongside the Israeli intelligence services. I worked alongside their military. And I worked alongside their leadership, including Prime Minister Netanyahu. I have every confidence that Prime Minister Netanyahu will execute his mission set 
which should be absolutely clear, which is the absolute annihilation of Hamas and the Iranians who are on the ground in the Gaza Strip as well, and ensure that something like this can never again happen to his country. And so they will do their best to fight this war consistent with international law. I know that with absolute certainty. And I'm confident that they will do their best to allow all of the innocents who are sitting inside of Gaza to get out of that place. It is tough. It, it, it is very, very difficult when an enemy chooses to behave so deeply and morally that they would put the citizens that they are responsible for. Remember, Hamas is not only a terrorist organization, but it considers itself the government of the Gaza Strip. They are doing this to their own. And so, yes, with the, my short answer to your question is yes, we should support the Israelis in taking down this terrorist threat. We should give them the space that they need to do that. We should give them the support that they need to do that. And we should give them, most importantly, the time that they're going to need to do that. And then the last thought, um, I, I lived this. Uh, I lived this in the Trump administration. The Iranian regime has been and remains the largest sponsor of terror anywhere in the world. The Iranians killed Americans on October 7th. We can talk about Hamas all we want. They are a shell company. This is an Iranian murder of Americans, and the Iranians are now holding American hostages. Think about this. Just a few weeks ago, the United States paid $6 billion dollars to get six Americans out, and the Iranians are now holding twice as many Americans as before we paid the six billion dollars. It's just, I, I know, I can see the looks on your faces. You're as stunned as I am. How is it the case that America can be played for a fool in that way? We, we know this. This, this, is a, this, is a, this is a regime that's trying to murder Americans today. You should know the reason for all this security is that they're trying to kill me. Right? They have a, they've offered a bounty on my head. It's not just me. They've now done it. They've killed Americans. And the United States is going to have to think its way through about how you take down a regime that will willingly kill citizens. We had a theory of the case in the Trump administration. I wrote letters to Qasem Soleimani, and I wrote letters to the Ayatollah. They were quiet letters. They were delivered clandestinely through the Swiss interlocutors. And we made just fundament this fundamental statement, which says, if you touch an American, we are not going to go after the knucklehead who fired the mortar round at your direction. We're not going to go, over the, go after the squad leader who actually rolled up on our embassy. We're going to come for the people who killed and directed the killing of Americans. And they did, and we did. And it began to work. By the time we left, we had virtually strangled the Iranian economy. And the attacks on Americans, the threats on Americans globally around the world had moved almost to zero. And um, we, we found a policy that came in after us that was fundamentally different. And while this is the responsibility of the Iranian regime and the Hamas terrorists, America's policy towards Iran for two and a half years set the context, the backdrop against which we now have been fighting a war for seven days. This is a question from one of our Tokpa fellows, Michael uh, Kennedy. Uh, given your experience as the director of the CIA, what advice do you have for young people in encountering morally difficult situations in their professional life? Oh, goodness. Um, I thought you were going to ask about uh, aliens. That's like the, <laughs> <laughs> it's like the first question I always get. My, my, those are great. My, my son, when I was nominated to be CIA director, I mean, we had no, I mean, we had no idea. I was a congressman from Kansas. Who, who would have dreamed, right? And I get nominated to be the CIA director, and uh, I called my son, and first thing he says is, okay, you're right, you are cool. Like, I, I, <laughs> didn't believe it for decades, now you're right. But the second thing he said was, he said, uh, he said Dad, you know, on your first day, you've got to go look at the UFO files. And, 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 and I know you won't be able to tell me what's in them, but when you see me next, just kind of like nod your head. <laughs> Shake your head. Uh. So my only answer to this question is the one that you all know, is that we confront moral dilemmas in our lives with enormous frequency. And certainly as the CIA director, you confront moral dilemmas all the time. You, right, you have a responsibility to execute and collect intelligence for the President of the United States. You have a responsibility to protect and keep the officers who serve underneath you safe and alive and return them to their families. And then in the other role you have, you have the responsibility to operate clandestinely in a way uh, that takes down risk. We had big operations in Afghanistan and elsewhere 
uh, where we, were, we had ground forces engaged in hard work. Uh, you, you, you have to know who you are. When, by the time I was sworn in as CI director, I was nearly fully formed in the sense of all that had come before set the backdrop for how I understood both America's place in the world and Mike's place as a servant to our country and a servant to God. And so I just always went back to those. Uh, you try to reason your way through these things. You, uh, you call on others who have deeper sets of wisdom than you. I, I turned to previous CIA directors. I turned to previous secretaries of state. I, I, I called people who were colleagues of mine in the business world because a lot of what we did had economic impact as well. And I tried to help, su help them uh, suss the good answers out for me. And then I, I turned to religious leaders as well and sought their guidance. I developed deep friendships with the leaders of the Orthodox Church, uh, folks in the Catholic Church, uh, evangelical leaders all across America, uh, uh, muftis in the Middle East. I spent a lot of time trying to listen to them and take on their understanding of the moral teachings as well. And then I laid that against the backdrop of our Judeo-Christian heritage and then moved forward to make recommendations to the President of the United States. I'm going to follow up with a question that came up in our discussion with the students earlier this afternoon. And we were talking about your role at the CIA. And tell, tell everyone what you told the students. If you were confronted with a, uh, an order from the president or a situation where you just you, you thought, you, I cannot do this. I cannot execute this <laughs> policy. I, could, I cannot in good conscience. Yeah. What would you do? Oh, it's pretty straightforward. This I would have learned as a young cadet. <clears throat> uh, first of all, I, I worked for a unique president, so I need to be ready to go, right? <laughs> Um, I, by the way, I actually think the truth is I think every president is pretty unique. Uh, if you go back through the, the, the list of now 46 of them. Uh, my task, right, I didn't get a single vote for a president. Uh, <laughs> president Trump reminded me of that all the time. <laughs> like, how many electoral votes did you get, Mike? Yes, sir, I, I pretty much zero. Uh, mm. But I did know a couple things. One is he had asked me to serve and to help him deliver on the things he'd promised the American people he would do. And so my task was to help him do that. And I had a big team. I had a big team when I was a CIA director and an even bigger team at the State Department. And our mission was to deliver for him and the American people every day. And so we would have knockdown drag outs about the right policy, often amongst the team before we would go see the president. Um, but even sometimes with the president, we would have fundamentally different policy views. Um, but my task was, once he issued the order, once he said, this is my decision, my task was to just put my head down and drive my organization, my team, to go execute it as best we could. Uh, but I always knew there could come a day when he'd tell me to do something that I thought was either illegal or immoral. And I was perfectly prepared to tender my resignation and thank him for the hours and days he had given me to serve in the roles that I had. Uh, I think as leaders, that's our obligation. You, you, you don't get to do the other option, which is if asked to do something that you believe you can't do, is to undermine the orders of the duly elected president of the United States. And so I was, the good news was I was never confronted with that. Uh, you know, he would, he, would, he would ask about things that we'd say, sir, we can't do that, that's illegal. You should, you know, you should, no, you should, you should, you should know as CI director, I would often come up with ideas. I'd say, why don't we do this? And some lawyer would say, yes, sir, no, you can't do that. So, uh, because you're thinking creatively, right? It's not that you're trying to violate the law. You're, you're literally trying to come up with solutions to really, really difficult problems. And so, so you would, you would make sure you did it inside the bounds of the rules. And I, but I always knew that, you know, there have been moments in American history where presidents have said, nope, I want you to do something. Sometimes they, sometimes they just had a different judgment about the law. And sometimes they were just very aggressive. And I just knew if I ever got to that place that there would be, there was a, I'm sure it would have been tough in the moment, but easy to decide what uh, Mike had to do. This is from Benjamin uh, Goldstein. Uh, what would you do to address uh, the demographic changes facing our nation today? <laughs> uh, so this is a challenge for uh, every developed nation uh, is that we are shrinking. Uh, where we, we, America stayed about the same, but only because of, of inward migration. Chinese, uh, China is shrinking as well. It will be less than a billion people. I think it's 25 years from now, 30 years from now. It's 1.4 billion people today, unless they permit migration into their country. Uh, 
the, the thing you do for, to sort of to get this right, to ensure that the nation continues to prosper and grow, is really a couplefold. First, you've got to get immigration policy right. Uh, that means immigration that is lawful and only immigration that is lawful. When you get that wrong, you create turmoil and chaos, and you risk terrorism inside of our own borders. I must say, the fact that we have 9,000 people a day coming across our border reminds me that while we all ask this question, like, how did Israel miss what was going on? I wonder whether we're missing something that might be going on inside of our own country, even as we sit in this auditorium today. So you should go get immigration policy right. But even more than that, we should build out the family as the center unit, the most important institution in the history of our country. And when we do that, when we reward family, and we take care of families, and we encourage family, family development, and we build all the things that need to be in place around it, then families will get bigger, and our nation's demographics will begin to turn to a place where I think everyone would be thrilled. This is from Sri, uh, one of our fellows. What do you think about the presidency, or the, pres the regime in El Salvador? Uh, should other leaders follow uh, the, his anti-crime mode? Oh my gosh, so I, I was the first foreign leader to go visit the then new president of El Salvador. Uh, remember he ran around a baseball cap, campaigned only on Twitter? Yeah, well, <laughs> didn't remind me of President Trump in some ways. <laughs> right? Think about it, baseball cap, Twitter. Uh, so it's, it's, I, I can't do justice to this in, in a couple minutes. Um, to the extent he has taken the cartels and the gangs apart, jot and tittle, I applaud him. I pray that he is doing so in a way that is reflective of the reality and not swooping up people for political purposes. Um, my sense is that he is mostly on the right side and that the people of El Salvador will benefit from what he has done. It is, it is a safer place today than it was when he took over, but we, we know that there's always the risk of overreach, certainly in a, in a place like El Salvador with a very difficult history, that is the case. Uh, this is from another student, Will Grannis. Um, you served as CIA director. Do you worry about the power of the deep state to stand in the way of true Republican government? Yeah, absolutely. I'm sweating already. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting, and I, I said this earlier to some of the students. So very different roles as a CIA director and as Secretary of State. You, you couldn't have different uh, organizations and therefore the required leadership model just completely different. Uh, the, the CIA is apolitical. The, that is, the workforce literally every day is trying to drive to good outcomes. It is providing and collecting intelligence. I saw relatively little politics there. Uh, they, they, were, they were just trying to do the right thing for America, the vast majority of the people at the agency. Uh, the other thing is that we didn't have to suffer the media. It was fantastic. You could fly wherever you wanted. Nobody, you didn't know where I was. It was great. Um, <laughs> the reference to the deep state, it's not the language that I use because I actually think it's worse than that. And when I say worse than that, I don't mean that it's Democrat or leftist, which is also true at the State Department. Um, it's provable. But what I, what, I, what I mean is it is not responsive to you. It, it believes it is an institution, an establishment of its own. Today, Every person working at the United States Department of State should be doing exactly what President Biden tells them to do. To the end. That's their mission. They are working for the President of the United States. When we were there, they should have been doing what President Trump wanted them to do every day. Uh, but that just simply was not my experience. Uh, we didn't have the ability to promote. We didn't have the ability to select the officers we wanted to take particular roles. There are three unions. It is an institution that is unmoored from our Constitution, and that's dangerous. That's really dangerous. So yes, I, I worry about it. I'm totally fixable. Uh, we'll take a long time and a President of the United States that is prepared to expend real political capital to achieve that, because it will not go quietly into the night. It has powerful lobbies. Uh, it has powerful interests. These are, after all, these are people, and the people themselves are good folks. Um, and it is not uniform, but there were too many people there that were trying at the edges to undermine what it was we were trying to do because we were pretty unique in the sense of we didn't come in with a historical set of understandings. I mean, literally, 
literally case that I was running a machine shop in Wichita, Kansas in 2009. Right? I didn't come from that foreign policy establishment, and goodness knows President Trump didn't either. Um, and so we were prepared to break things and try different things. We, we set up summits with Chairman Kim. We, we negotiated with the Arabs to achieve peace with Israel, right? These were, these were ideas that people said, well, you can't do these things. And as you can see, we, we didn't get the nuclear weapons out of Chairman Kim's hand. That didn't work. But we did break through the conundrum that for decades and decades sent Secretary of State's traveling from uh, Jerusalem to Ramallah back and forth negotiating over lines. Instead, we said, no, we're just going to we're going to make peace. And we did. And those things drove the State Department absolutely bonkers. Uh, and, and, and that's unfortunate, because we need every one of our agencies to be responsive to the leadership that's duly elected. Okay. A question from Steve Gregory, class of 88. Uh, please share your impressions of the North Korean dictator, Kim Jong-un, based on your personal interaction. I know you write about this in your book. <laughs> I do write about it in the book. Uh, so. Uh, I spent more time with him than any other American. The previous record holder was Dennis Rodman. <laughs> I, I told Nick, I said, I told you I'd break NBA records. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I was, the, the, the story is really, it's a great story because the president, I was the CIA director and the president said, hey, can we talk to the North Koreans? And we, we had a way we could do it. And he says, good, we can do it. I said, we can do it clandestinely. He's like, great, tell them, tell them you're gonna come see them. Oh, Roger, sir. He goes, yeah, and tell them that I'm going to come see them, but only after you. Uh, so we built, out, we built out a model that said maybe if we have these summits, we can convince him to give up his nuclear weapons. That was the hypothesis we began. I created a Korea mission center inside the CA, all purpose built to try and deliver that outcome. Uh, as a result of that, I probably spent, I think, 13 or 14 hours with Chairman Kim. Uh, he's uh, incredibly well informed. That is, he knew where all of their missile program was. He knew where their enrichment facilities were. He knew their shortcomings inside the country. That is, he, he, he knew the file. He was, it was educated and informed. Uh, plenty smart enough to understand that when we told him, hey, you can give up your nuclear weapons and you can still survive, he knew that it probably wasn't true. Um, and so I, I, you know, I, I credit him for that much. But remember, I was sitting across from someone who'd killed Otto Warmbier. On my very first trip, uh, it was very shortly after Otto, who had been in detention in North Korea, was returned home only to die from his maltreatment in containment inside of North Korea. He's a tyrannical, nasty bastard. And he's killed thousands and thousands of his own people, and he would just as soon kill 150 million Americans as give up power. And that's what I saw when I sat across from him as well. Um, we, you know, we would, uh, it was, it's always hard when you're in those uh, because you, you know who's across the table and yet you have this task of trying to develop a relationship with them to convince them to do something that you know is in your own people's best interest. And so he and I developed a kind of a quirky, funny relationship. I'm happy I don't ever have to spend another second with him. Uh, um, and I hope that the, our successors will have more success than we did at convincing him that holding those nuclear weapons aren't in his best interest. Okay. I'm going to introduce my own question here just to go on the theme. Um, tell us how you would have us think about Vladimir Putin. You know, those two are a lot alike. Uh, they're a lot alike in that they, they, they intrinsically, it is innate, it's in their DNA that they are, they are right about the things that they say on stage. And we say, well, that's just falderall. That's just silliness. They, they believe it. You know, Putin, in our conversations, I didn't spend as much time with him. I was, I was probably with him for six or seven hours and about double that if you count time alongside President Trump. You know, if you asked him about Ukraine, he would, it doesn't compute for him, right? It, it'd be like you asking me, like, is Kansas part of America? I'd go, yeah. And then someone would say, well, why? It would take me just a second. I could go back through the history and explain it. For him, it's the same thing. He, he views Moldova, he views the uh, Baltic nations, he views Ukraine as part of Russia. It's who he is. And, you know, he's happy to launch missiles into schools and uh, fire at school buses. It's immaterial to him that he takes human life. 
And this is the thing that's so hard for all of us, I think, to comprehend. When you see what happened on October 7th in the Middle East, to, to comprehend those people who got up that morning and decided today we are going to go rape women and kill babies. Just think about what, like, this is so, so, so at the can of even, I mean, there's no, where we talk about there's the polarization in America, right? We, it's just like, this is like, you know, the left, the right, this is, this is, these guys are not on the spectrum in that sense, right? It's so far out of our ordinary understandings of humanity that sometimes we forget that that evil is real and is threatening and that they are not passive and that they're going to just let us go do our thing and leave us alone and only terrorize their own people. And that's the task for leaders. The task for leaders is to articulate who Vladimir Putin really is and who Chairman Kim is and who Xi Jinping are in a way that people can understand and then be prepared to give their leaders the power, authority, and resources to protect them from these very, very bad actors. Okay. I'm ignoring the uh, trending question about the CIA killing JFK here. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to take that one. Okay. <laughs> Only to tell you this much, it's as close as I ever came to getting fired. That's not true. It's second closest. Uh, the, uh, there's a series of documents that are referred to as the Kennedy Papers. Long story. But the president had promised he would release all the Kennedy Papers. And the CI director is the responsible for the classification authority for all of that. And so there came a day when they were supposed to all be out. And Fox News is going crazy because we're not going to release them all. And the president calls and says, why won't you release them all? I said, Mr. President, there's stuff in there we just can't release. He says, my kids can't be. This stuff is, you know, 70 years old or 60 years old. Mr. President, I, I'm happy to come show you some of it, but trust me, there are things in here, there are personal information that we just we can't leave out. And, you know, hangs the phone up. And uh, uh, I'm, I forget where I was in the world. I get a call from then Chief of Staff John Kelly. And John's a great American, amazing Marine. And John as midnight where I was, and he says, he says, where are you? And I said, I'm so, he says, release them all. Let it all out. I said, John, come on, we're not doing that. He says, get them all out. He says, I was just in there. He screamed at me. He was, he was, he was mad. <laughs> he, like, he says, I've done my best to fight this fight, Mike. Just let it go. You've lost this argument. I said, John, is this an order? Because this would be a lawful order, right? I said, is this an order? <laughs> of course, Kelly's like, I won't, he used an adult word, but bang, hangs the phone up. <laughs> and, uh, so I flew back, and two days later, I went to see the president, and I, I got the president to a better place. And the president says, uh, by the way, not, nothing in any of this. I, I millions of pages of documents. There's no, everybody talks about this with great conspiracy. Trust me, we got bigger problems. Um, and the uh, president says, fine, don't release it. But will you call Lou Dobbs and tell him to stop beating the crap out of me? <laughs> <laughs> Deal. Absolute deal. Yeah. I think I think it was a yes or no question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> by the way, it, it's it's worth it's worth no, it's worth noting that it's worth noting that. Uh, by the way, I, I have read them all. Um, you should have great confidence in the data set that's been released. That's the best way to say. It. You should. Know the Biden administration kind of did the same thing. They were faced that they were they wanted to release them all too, and they came across the info side and and made a very similar decision to what what we did, and probably the right one. This is from a, a recent alumna. Um, how concerned should everyday Americans be about personal privacy and internet security? I just assume that's all gone. <laughs> uh, uh, and by the way, that, that risk uh, is sometimes from your government. Sometimes it'll screw it up. Um, you should know that your government is meticulous about protecting your privacy. I saw it at the NSA, who was our partner, the Signals team that's adjacent to the CIA. Um, I think the FBI does a very nice job of that as well. There are big, deep rubrics, reviews, thousands of lawyers trying our best to comply with the law. And sometimes, frankly, mostly my party kind of just misses that because there's always bad actors. Somebody will decide to snoop on their ex-girlfriend or what have you, um, throw them in jail. Um, the, the people who are mostly watching you are the people that you've invited inside the tent by signing, yes, I accept your terms of the agreement, or uh, by logging on to their systems, including the systems that belong to the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and so we should, all, we should all be aware that online there is an enormous amount of risk that someone is able to track your habits, the, the people with whom you associate, the places that you go. 
Um, but the United States government, we, I have a pretty good sense of how it's doing and what it's doing. Um, people will have different views about the scope of how big the U.S. surveillance state ought to be. Those are worthy debates, but the biggest risk, frankly, uh, to your privacy doesn't come from that place. It comes from the U.S. private sector, who you have permitted to do it, uh, because you wanted a really cool ad on Amazon, uh, or bad actors around the world, or sometimes even private actors here inside the United States as well. Uh, this question is from Luke Foster, our uh, postdoctoral fellow. Uh, what lessons should U.S. foreign policy take from, and I'm just reading the question, from our failures in Iraq and Afghanistan? Oh, goodness. Um, I, I, if I, if to do that quickly, I would answer, and to, to, to tie them together, be very careful about permanent commitments when there's no clear mission statement. Uh, and I think in each of those cases, we continued to move the objective uh, without the clarity that is required when you're going to put our young men and women at risk. And so that was the lesson. That's certainly the lesson that we tried to use to shape our decisions about how to deploy um, our Department of Defense forces in the Trump administration. Uh, you know, I know less about Iraq than I, because I wasn't in government service at the time uh, than I do about Afghanistan. I watched that one up close and personal. Uh, I had a president who had promised you he would get every one of your soldiers out of Afghanistan, and you liked it. You all, the American people, largely supported that. Uh, and so did, so did your Secretary of State. But we also knew that we had to do it rationally, and President Trump actually gave us the space to do that. There were 15,000 U.S. uniform personnel on the ground in Afghanistan when we came into office, and the day we left, there were about 2,500. So call it 80 to 90 percent of them out of the country, and we had relative Afghan stability. Uh, President Biden then made a fateful decision. He set a date certain, and you see the calamity of what befell America. Uh, it didn't have to be. I get asked all the time, would President Trump have done that? And I, these, these are the unknowables. If President Trump was here, he'd say, oh, of course not. I wouldn't do it. Um, I always describe it this way. He didn't. I can prove that. Right? He, he didn't. As much as he wanted to, as much as his gut told him, I want everyone out, he knew that if we lost Bagram Air Force Base and if we pulled the final people out with that, without the Afghans having reached a political resolution inside of their country, that you would get Americans killed, you'd lose billions of dollars of equipment, and there would again be the risk that the Taliban would attack from that place. And so every time he would say, you're not getting out fast enough, we would remind him that we had a set of objectives, all of which need, the conditions, all of which needed to be met. And each time he said, fine, go faster. This is from Nathan Groh, one of our PhD students in theology. Could you speak to the state of American military readiness for possible conflict in Taiwan, especially given the resources we are now deploying in Ukraine and Israel? Yeah, I don't think either of those will have a material impact on our readiness to fight if we need to fight in Asia. Um, having said that, it is tough. That is a long ways over there. And so to project power that far, we're the only country that has the potential to do it, but it is a very hard mission. And we are way too slow, including on our watch, we are way too slow at redirecting the resources to the right place. For 20-odd years, we did counterterrorism. That's what the Department of Defense was structured around. Uh, elite units, special units fighting in hard places doing counterterrorism. And we began to reshape the military saying, no, we have this great power that is hegemonic in intention with a very capable set of military. We need to be prepared to help our treaty partners, Japan and the Philippines, and the other partners in the region. And so we did the diplomatic effort to build out the coalition and began to reset our military in a way. Uh, I would say if, if, um, if I was sitting across from my former counterpart, Wang Yi, the head of the Chinese Foreign Ministry, I would say, I dare you. You may think, and you may get a moment, but this will end badly for you. And that's the best way to describe our military capability. I believe that with all my heart. We are still very capable. Last thought there. We darn well better protect that institution. That institution can be politicized as well. If the military ceases to focus on the things that matter, the capacity to deter our adversaries, if it spends its days and nights thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, 
And if it spends its days and nights saying, as President Biden has repeatedly said, I want every military vehicle to be carbon neutral by 2040. That's not my words, these are his. The, and by the way, you can see it, go to the wall of a barracks. Go, go to Kaiserslaut, go to, go to a barracks in, in uh, Japan. You can see it's on the walls. The, 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 we used to have stickers that say, you know, death from above. Okay, maybe inappropriate. <laughs> but, but today they say, make sure you turn off the vehicle so as not to emit carbon, okay? Equally inappropriate. Folk, we, 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 we have to, and by the way, we, you all see the challenges we're having in recruiting today. We're about to have a massive seven-year shortfall in recruitment, looks like. We're projecting now six years from now. We had one last year, and it looks like that is devastating. E7s, E5s, the enlisted backbone of our military will be hollowed out in ways that are just very difficult to replace. Um, well, if you're a young Marine, right, you're a kid, you're thinking, I want to go, I'm going to go to the recruiting station today, and you show up, and it says, uh, join the Navy, find a safe space. Like, no, you want to go break stuff, right? <laughs> and, and so you, 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 we have to just, it, it's not, my, my tank gunner was, a, was a, a kid who was a naturalized American. He was Jordanian by background. But I didn't pick him because he was a diversity hire for my tank. I picked him because he was a really good tank gunner. And I wanted to stay alive. It was so selfish. <laughs> I, I mean, it truly was. If we focus on merit and reward merit inside that institution, then our military will remain the finest. But if we try to use it for some other objective, some secondary goal, and we move it off its core mission, then I don't know if 10 years from now, Philip, I'll be able to say that same thing, that I would be able to warn my Chinese counterpart that taking on America was something you do not want to do. There was a question about the likelihood of war. I'm taking yeah. it from your answer, you think, between China and Taiwan, you think the likelihood of war depends on us. Uh, oh yeah, absolutely. It, it, all, it all turns on, uh, on how we behave. If we are, uh, if we are in a full-on appeasement mode and we give the suggestion that it'd be just fine if you take Taiwan and we'll let you have you know, one bite at the apple, kind of the model in Ukraine, right? Uh, fine, take this much but no more. Uh, we increase the probability that Xi Jinping does it. I actually, uh, most of my Republican friends think they'll be a, a kinetic conflict. I don't. I think Xi Jinping thinks he can take Taiwan without firing a shot, using United Front, espionage, win elections, all of those things over time, strangle them economically. Uh, it seems a far more likely risk, and one that the United States has the power to, uh, if not prevent, to to extend the duration and create space because what, what the objective there has to be to create the space for Taiwan such that Xi Jinping is no longer the leader and the Chinese Communist Party leadership, uh, much like some of Xi Jinping's predecessors, no longer believes that global hegemony is the objective. Um, this is a question that most people uh, want asked. Are the intelligence failures in Israel a bad sign for U.S. national security? I don't know, because I, I, don't know, I don't know exactly what the scope, scale, and cause, causal relationship was for those failures. Uh, it, it's, it's hard. I, the, the pressure when you're the CIA director is enormous, because if something like that happens on your watch, they're going to blame you for having failed an intelligence failure. The truth is, it's hard to know everything everywhere always. <laughs> it's, it's a, right? It's, it's a nightmare. And you miss things, and you misread things, and your analysts struggle sometimes to determine commander's intent of your adversaries. And so I don't, wanna, I don't wanna suggest that I know the answer to what failed there. Clearly, they were incapable of deterring the adversary in the strategic sense, and then tactically on the ground, they didn't have the resources necessary to repel what was a sizable, yet pretty rudimentary attack. So yes, I, I worry about America getting intelligence and collection wrong every day. I'll give you one great example, though, where we got it right, not, not me. Uh, the Biden administration knew in September of 21 that Putin was going to invade Ukraine. And they went around the world telling our friends in Europe that they were going to invade. And guess what? They didn't believe us. They, they literally said, ah, you guys have it wrong. This is a lesson from Iraq, right? Where we, we said something that was fundamentally wrong and the world suffered. I think they thought this is America and they may be wrong again. And so for five months, when we could have done a lot more to save Ukrainian lives, the world sat still and allowed Putin to build his forces. 
So intelligence matters. We, we, that one, the United States intelligence agencies got exactly right. I hope we keep getting them right. Okay. Uh, one more question. Uh, this is uh, related uh, to a very dear subject here at Notre Dame to our football game, but I need, to, <laughs> I need to preface this comment. So as everyone in this room knows, I'm a big defender of free speech. And we uh, invited you out to come to the USC games, big game. We wanted you here for that game. And then I found out you're from Southern California. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I've never rescinded an invitation, but I was thinking about it. <laughs> but then I found out you're a UCLA fan. I'm a Bruin fan. My son's a UCLA Bruin. Yes. <laughs> Historical Big Ten school. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we kept the invitation on the basis of a common enemy. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> What's your prediction on the score tomorrow? Oh, I, 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 I don't do predictions about Vladimir Putin, Chairman Kim, or Notre Dame football. <laughs> one, one last thought before I let you get on with, with your weekend and the joy that the weekend will bring. Pray for the nation of Israel and all the people who are there. Pray for the region as well. Uh, pray for the innocents in Gaza also. These are human beings that we should love, and their lives are to be cherished as well. Um, we have to stop the massacre. And the way to stop the massacre is to eliminate the threat. And I pray that we will do that. You know, my, my wife jokes, um, I'll get asked questions, and it all sounds pretty dire. I, it's true. For four years, I'd get up, and I would read the intelligence briefings, and it's a pretty dark way to start your morning. Uh, it, it wore on me. There, there's no doubt about that. You can see, if you look at the pictures of me at the end of my time, it's like, dude needs to check out. Man. Like, <laughs> like, uh, you should know that she'll say, she'll say like, like, when people walk out, they're like going to go grab a bourbon or a Xanax or both. And like, <laughs> by the way, that's bad, both. Bad idea. <laughs> uh, nothing could be further from the truth. I am long on America. I look out at you all. And I got a chance to be with students from this university. I am confident all these problems, all these bad guys, we're going to find our way through them. But I want you to know why. It's not a, a false optimism. Uh, that, it's, not, it's not kind of a rah-rah America optimism. The optimism comes, of course, my faith. I believe deeply that God is watching over us. But it also comes from the fact that I get to be with so many amazing people around the world. And I remind you, don't count on some knucklehead who runs for office and gets elected, right, in Washington, D.C. I pray we get good presidents and great senators and super good congressmen. I want that. We definitely deserve it. But don't, don't look to that to solve all of these great problems. The greatness of America always stemmed from people who decided, I'm going to serve on my homeowners association board, or I'm going to run for city council, or I'm going to take brownies to the PTA meeting, or I'm going to lead my Boy Scout troop, or I'm going to go to the synagogue and uh, help some struggling child. These are, the, these are the things and places that when I was secretary, that's what I thought about. When I had moments to myself, when there was just a little more, I thought about all the things, the little pieces that Susan and I did, and we saw others in our community in Wichita, Kansas doing. Those don't exist elsewhere in the world. They just, they, this, doesn't, this doesn't happen. These, these institutions, right, built around family, built around community, built around cities, run for school board. Help someone who's chosen to do so. Can you hear on your campus at Notre Dame, there are hundreds of ways you can be part of this community and, and make America the nation that the world looks up to. If we all resolve and just say, oh my goodness, look at those guys in Washington, those gals, they're just, it's all bad, then, then the republic does have some risk. But I, I don't sense that that's the direction of travel for our country. My sense is that people are seeing that they have some sense of getting this right. I mean this too. I ran a business. Um, those of you who are uh, in the business world, running businesses, working at companies, those are places too where we interact with our fellow Americans and get a chance to, to help them be better, better at their job, uh, help them with problems they might be having in their life. Do those things. Be, be that good neighbor that, that, that the Bible teaches us to be and be, be of that world. And when you do that, when we each do our small part in that place, then I'm pretty darn confident that we'll get another 250 years of a nation that the world looks up to. I'm counting on each of you. I'll do my best to do my little part as well. Bless you and thank you for the opportunity to be with you. Thank you, sir.
you. Yeah.